What is up guys? Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to be reviewing the Instax Mini Evo. Now this is the next evolution of the Instax Mini, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this camera. This is one of the best selling cameras of all time. It is not a Polaroid, stop calling it a Polaroid. <laughs> but this is the next evolution of the Instax Mini. It is a digital film hybrid camera that allows you to take photos and then choose whether or not you want to print them out. This camera takes the exact same film as this camera, and what you see behind me is a mix of photos that I took with both of these cameras. The Instax Evo is not like other instant film cameras. It doesn't open the shutter and expose the film and then eject the film as the chemicals combine and produce the image. No, this camera opens the shutter and exposes the sensor, which then saves a digital copy of the image, and then when you choose to print that image, it will expose the image as it's ejecting through the slot. So technically, it's not an instant film camera. Technically, it is a digital camera and film printer combined. This hybridization of these technologies also allows you to connect to your smartphone and choose to print digital images straight from your smartphone. I've actually only tried that with one photo, um, this one, and I think it turned out pretty well. I, I really like the richness of the colors that it maintained in the digital image. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanna introduce this camera before I talk more about my opinions on it. I've taken about 100 photos with this thing. I've chosen to print about 80 of them. Most of them are on this side, but I feel like I've experimented with it enough at this point to give you a pretty robust overview of the camera's functionality, everything that you would wanna know if you're making the decision to buy this or trying it out for the first time. So, all that said, without further ado, let's jump right into the first section, which I have titled Specs. The Instax Evo retails for around 250 Canadian dollars, or around $200 American, which is double the price of the rest of the Instax Mini line. I do think this price increase is justified since this camera has significantly more functionality than this one. It allows you to change both the color profile and the lens style of the photos that you're taking in camera, and I'll talk a bit more about those modes later on, but in my opinion, this functionality alone justifies the price increase. The Instax Mini Evo has a 20 mm lens and it shoots at f2. The shutter speed is automatic and it ranges from 1 4th of a second to 1 8,000th of a second. So that's pretty impressive in my opinion for a camera that is borderline novelty. It has an ISO range that is also automatic and it ranges from 100 to 1600 ISO. I would not recommend shooting anything above 400 ISO with this without using the built-in flash. At the higher ISOs, you start to get a lot of color noise that can really interrupt that analog feel and really starts to feel more like digital lomography than analog lomography. It does have a cold shoe, which allows you to attach accessories to it. That is pretty neat. It is not a hot shoe. There's no electrical component to this, but you can put things like, you know, a mounted LED light or something on here if you wanted to add some extra light to a scene without triggering that flash. As well as the cold shoe, it has a tripod thread, which is cool, and it's also got these little attachments for a neck strap. The neck strap makes it very, very easy to carry around. <laughs> and look, all of my outfits are black and silver, and so it matches most of what I wear. <laughs> all jokes aside, I do really like the neck strap. I think it is a phenomenal improvement from the wrist strap, which causes the camera to bang around against everything that you reach for. This, you can just put it at your side. It is very lightweight and very thin, as you can see, so it's not very disruptive when you're wearing it. I've worn this on hikes. I wore it for like a two hour bushwhacking adventure through a bog. And at no point did I feel like it was getting in the way. Because it's narrow and because it doesn't have a lens that sticks out, like this one does, it's not constantly snagging on things. It has a very low chance of banging against something because it stays really tight to your hip. So overall, the design with the neck strap Big thumbs up from me. Speaking of that two hour bushwhacking adventure, <laughs> this is also very durable, which I discovered. I have gotten it slightly wet. I have dropped it maybe twice and it has not impaired or altered the functionality in any way. I attribute that mostly to its light weight. I think when it hits the ground because it's so light, it's not this catastrophic impact. So it's less likely <laughs> to damage the internal components. I do feel like I mentioned the durability of cameras in a lot of my camera review videos. And unfortunately that's because I do tend to drop them fairly frequently. So that's a big item for me. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. This has an internal memory that will store around 45 images, but it's also got a slot where you can put a micro SD card in. So if you're going to the store to buy one of these, just like 
do yourself a favor and buy a micro SD card at the same time. You can charge this camera with a micro USB cable. It came out very recently. I don't know why it's still doing micro USB and not USB-C. It would be great if this were USB-C, but I guess they are saving that for the Instax Evo 2, or I hope they are. It does seem to need to be charged fairly frequently in my experience. And I attribute that to the LCD screen on the back, which it has instead of a viewfinder. So yes, there is no viewfinder on this camera. Mirrorless enthusiasts won't bat an eye, but people who prefer that kind of analog feel might have a bit of a problem with this. I personally do not mourn the loss of the viewfinder, but because of this LCD screen, I have to charge it pretty much every week and a half to two weeks. And I'm only using it for like 15 minutes a day, sometimes more, often less. So, you know, it, you don't get a lot of usage out of one charge. I burned through an entire battery in like three days when I was in Minneapolis. Oh, and speaking of power sucking functions, it's also got a built-in flash, which I love. Every Instax Mini should always have a built-in flash. I think it's just so good for that retro, like, party photo look. You're getting a bunch of people together in a dark room. It's great to have a flash, especially since it's a cold shoe. The flash is not particularly powerful. I would consider it to be rather dinky, <laughs> but maybe that's just because I've been spoiled by Godox. Anyways, I could talk about this thing's functionality all day. There's a lot of functions that I haven't talked about yet. A selfie mirror and a photo gallery and a self timer, and you can set the white balance and it's got face detection. And there's a smartphone connection app that you can download to do all kinds of things. But Anyway, you kind of get the picture. It's a very useful camera. So now I want to talk about something a little bit more fun, which is the color modes. The Instax Evo has color modes and it also has lens effects. And the color modes are called films and the lens effects are called lens. <laughs> and you can use different combinations of lens settings and color settings. So this dial controls the lens and this dial controls the color. There are 10 color settings and they are as follows. <laughs> I'm going to read them off my list. There's normal, vivid, pale, canvas, monochrome, sepia, yellow, red, blue, and retro. There's also 10 lens settings, and the lens settings are as follows. There's normal, vignette, soft focus, blur, fisheye, color shift, light leak, mirror, double exposure, and half frame. So that means that there's a hundred unique combinations of lens and color settings. I have not shot with all of these combinations. Once I found a few that I really, really liked, I just kind of gravitated towards those. <laughs> the mirror setting is absolutely my favorite mode. Oh my God, the mirror mode is so cool. I took so many great mirrored shots in Minneapolis of the architecture. I've taken a lot of really cool mirrored portrait shots so far. I just really like it. It's a lot of fun to play with. The double exposure, however, was a little bit disappointing. It doesn't work like a typical analog double exposure where you take a texture photo and you take a silhouette photo and the two together, the texture will fill the silhouette. Instead, it digitally overlays the two images and it seems to give the same weight or value to both images. So bright areas of the silhouette shot still have a significant amount of the texture shot visible in them, which I don't love. And it does kind of disrupt the double exposure effect and it can easily make the shot look too busy. Um, the worst mode, in my opinion, is the half frame. I dislike the half frame so much that it is almost resentment. <laughs> so the half frame mode takes one photo that goes on the top half of the frame and one photo that goes on the bottom half of the frame. And then for some reason, it puts a big thick black line in between the two photos. This would be such a cool mode if it didn't put the black line there. Most Instax mini film borders are white. So why they wouldn't make it a white line if they really insist on putting a line there in the first place, I would prefer them to just line up like this so that you could do fun things with like, you know, one person like this and then flip the camera over and have them like this. You know, there's so many ways that you could play with it if it didn't have that stupid line. <laughs> Oh, it drives me crazy. Mr. Fuji, if you're watching this and I'm addressing all of Fuji film right now, please fix that in Evo Mini 2. I would like to see that fixed. Other modes that I haven't played with are fisheye and vignette. The fisheye does look like it would be really cool for the black frame. And I've got some of that on order, so I'll probably play around with the fisheye a bit. I also haven't used the vignette, Kind of for the same reason, I feel like it would look better with the black frame. Can't say much about those. And as for the rest of the settings, I have gotten some enjoyment out of color shift, soft focus, and light leap. Color shift creates this kind of chromatic aberration effect that can be really neat for otherwise simple images. I think soft focus creates a really nice sort of 
dreamy portrait look that was super effective in this image for some reason. And then light leak is just kind of like your classic Instagram filtered light leak, which I definitely get a kick out of because it brings me back to the early days of Instagram. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. As for the color settings, I actually shot a series of still lifes specifically for this video of these reflective cups in studio. And I set up a red, green, and blue LED light so that you'd get like an idea of the full spectrum of wavelengths and how they're represented by the different color settings this camera has to offer. So here's what the scene actually looked like, right? And then here is how the blue mode captured this scene. And here's how the red mode captured this scene. And here is how the retro mode captured this scene. Personally, I think retro turned out the coolest this way. I find retro actually does look really neat when you're photographing points of light rather than daylight. Here's another scene I shot with red and blue LEDs only. And this one shows the difference between normal mode and red mode. And also it shows how bad the half frame mode is. <laughs> I like these color modes, they're great. But ultimately most of the photos that I have taken have been with the vivid color setting because it is just nicer. <laughs> this is the first shot that I ever took on the Instax Evo. And oh my God, I was smitten from like moment one. Because if you compare the vivid color mode on the Evo to just like a regular Instax mini shot that I took with my old Instax mini, the difference is like night and day. Like it is incredible how much richer the color can be on the exact same film. But this is why I say the price is justified because it's just so enjoyable getting these beautiful rich shots. Oh, one thing that I wanted to say about the blue color mode before I move on is that it does help to make red and orange tones pop. And so it can bake in a complementary red and blue color scheme into any photo, which is neat if you have kind of a scene that's got a lot of conflicting colors and you wanna kind of homogenize them a little bit, I think the blue mode is a great way to do that. As for the rest of the color modes, I haven't played around too much with them. The only ones that I really haven't tried are yellow, sepia, and canvas. Mostly just because I'm not a fan of any of them. I'm not a fan of the way that canvas looks. I look, think it looks a bit tacky. It kind of like superimposes this canvas texture over everything. Oh, I also haven't shot with pale. Pale just takes the saturation out of everything, which personally I don't like the look of, but that's my artistic choice. And then yellow, I think, makes everything look a bit garish. Okay, moving on to the next section. Uh, now that I've talked about color modes and there's like a million other things that I could say about that, but I'm gonna leave it there because I wanna move on and talk about pros and cons. And just give you like a quick rapid fire summary of everything that I've talked about so far. And you can make up your mind if you wanna buy this camera or not. So the pros are, that it is very lightweight, it has a neck strap, it has many settings to help foster creativity. You will not waste film with this camera. You will have greater control over your images through the settings available, including the flash, the self timer, the color modes, the lens modes, etc. The cons. It is a lot more expensive than your typical Instax Mini. It is not great in low light, and I wouldn't recommend using it in low light without the flash. It has limited internal storage. 45 images is not a lot. Some of the modes are kind of gimmicky. It needs to be charged fairly often, and the digital versions of the photos are fairly low resolution. I didn't mention that one in the video, but I should say something about it. I have not been saving the digital versions of these photos, as you might be able to tell by the fact that I've just been showing you pictures of the printed versions. Two reasons for that. Number one is that I do not have a spare micro SD card and I haven't bought one yet. I should have. So I don't have digital copies, but also I have been deleting the digital images to preserve the analog feel of the camera. I like thinking that I take the picture and it prints the picture out and this is the picture and the picture doesn't exist anywhere else, even though it was originally a digital image. And so I'm kind of doing mental gymnastics to get over the fact that this is a digital camera first and foremost. And I am trying to treat it in my head and in my heart as an analog camera, which is a great segue into my last section here, which is called corrupting the analog feel. This is something that I've seen mentioned a few times in reviews of this camera, that the analog digital hybridness creates a bit of discord in the hearts and minds of ride or die analog enthusiasts. Let's talk about that. What is the analog feel. I like to create art within parameters. The stricter the parameters, the more fun I have making the art. I like lomography for this reason. I like novelty films for this reason. And in general, I like film photography for this reason. I think that a lot of photographers in the modern day feel the same way. And a lot of us lean towards film photography because of the parameters that are baked into the medium. Most notably, the fact that you only get one shot. 
right? If you take a shot on film, you are burning that image into a physical object, and that physical object exists forever. There's no redos, there's no deleting it and, and taking it again. You can take more shots of the same thing, but that original shot still exists, and it will always exist until you decide to destroy the physical object. A big part of the appeal here is that you have to be a lot more selective and discerning of the subjects that you are photographing. So each photo means a lot more. There's this auspicious quality to it when you're shooting on film. So when I reference corrupting the analog feel, I'm mostly talking about how this camera eliminates that parameter. You can take a shot on this, decide you don't like it, and then decide not to print it. And that's great because you waste less film and you have less all black or all white rectangles kicking around in your life. But it also means that when you do get a good shot, it's a lot less of a trophy. It's the best of many rather than the one and only. It's all mental, right? It's all about the feelings of the artist, the emotional impact of the act of creating art. And it's not actually about the camera itself. But when you're shooting with novelty cameras or doing lomography in some sense, it's kind of all about the feelings of the artist anyway, right? Like, it's about how much fun you're having creating the images, what your headspace is, and it's not about the actual quality of the image you produce. At least for most people, I think that's a big part of why we enjoy lomography and film photography in general, maybe. So when I'm taking pictures with this camera, I'll admit I don't get the same emotional sense of satisfaction when I take a really good image on it that I get out of taking a good image on my Instax Mini 8. There isn't the same one-shot challenge parameter. But that said, I do waste less film and I do take better pictures and I get to put them all up on my wall and then when I walk by them I can see them and smile and think to myself, wow, I'm such a talented photographer. I get more bang for my buck out of the packs of film that I do buy and I have way more opportunity for creativity in camera. I get a lot of joy out of experimenting with the creative filters and effects that this camera has to offer and I can create them a lot more easily than if I were to create them digitally in post-production using more polished images. So ultimately, I see it as a trade-off. You're trading some measure of that analog feeling in exchange for tools that help you be more creative within the medium. And honestly, this does feel a bit like digital lomography to me. It reminds me of the early days of Instagram when filters were still cool and trendy and putting an Instagram filter on your photo transformed it in a way that a lot of people hadn't seen before. I get this feeling of nostalgia for the digital age playing with this. And honestly, I think that hits me just right because I was a very young teen when Instagram came out and oh my God, did it have a huge impact on my creative development as a photographer and my early experiments into photography. So yeah, there's my thoughts. Hopefully that helps you to resolve some of your feelings around corrupting the analog nature of things. You could call it digital lomography if you want. You can pretend that there's no digital component and do things to eliminate the digital component if you want. But overall, I think the thing that matters most with this camera is your enjoyment taking photos with it. Take your photos in whichever way is going to maximize that enjoyment. And it's a digital analog hybrid camera. You get to pick if you wanted to do more digital, more analog, it's up to you. There you go. That's everything that I had to say about this camera. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this review was helpful. If you liked it, you can leave a comment and a like down below. I would really appreciate that. I'm gonna be talking about this camera again, probably in the near future. I've got some new film on the way, so I wanna do a tier list of all the Instax mini films and which ones are the best, something like that. So that's on the horizon. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next week with a new video. And in the meantime, I want you to stay sharp and don't forget to keep shooting. Bye guys.